whatever those uh, things are. It's our job to make sure that they have the same experience that all of our guests have. And in doing so, uh, we should have some background on how to do it. So when uh, Denise and the college came and said, hey, we want you guys to do a uh, dining in the dark experience here at the college, I realized that this was a better opportunity to do it right here in class. Because that's what you came to school for, was to learn how to do these things. Um, we could have made this event for an entire program, but it felt like it would fit better in a class that actually teaches you how to uh, wait on customers and how to prepare food for those customers. So uh, tomorrow is our Dine in the Dark Day. Um, I'm really excited to see how it all goes. Um, and I know that uh, it will definitely experience that you will never forget, hopefully. Um, so that when you are out in the industry, whether you're a chef at the restaurant, whether you're the general manager, whether you're the front of the house uh, control in the dining room, you will have an understanding of what needs to happen and how to manage that. And uh, at least that's the goal. So this is Denise Jess, and she's going to give us a presentation here. She's got her partner here to help us as well. On this screen, we have a play set, and you know here is a PowerPoint. So please pay attention and uh, give them your utmost attention. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Thanks for that great introduction. Um, I am Denise Jess. I'm the CEO of the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired. And with me um, at the tripod with the um, camera this morning is Hannah Wenty. And Hannah is our communications director. So I know it's your first morning back after spring break. Um, my um, older daughter was home for spring break and it was wonderful to see her. And my younger daughter, who's still a high school senior, started spring break this morning. So I am well aware of the energy and the excitement of starting and the, oh my God, we gotta go back. So, um, <laughs> so this morning, my hope is that this presentation is really engaging. I'm gonna give lots of opportunities Opportunities for you to add your knowledge so that it isn't just a sit and get kind of thing but lots of opportunities for you to um, to share ideas as well so that we co-create a really positive um, experience this morning so as Paul mentioned um, dining in the dark is happening here tomorrow it's an event that we host with various restaurants around the community and throughout Wisconsin um, on a regular basis. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Dining in the Dark um, in just a couple of minutes. But I wanna share with you first that I'm just thrilled to be here because I love food. Um, I, I do, I love the dining experience. Uh, I've been in a kind of a streak of going out to eat a lot. Uh, which isn't great for my pocketbook, but it's great for my culinary taste buds. And I'm always really mindful of what that experience is like for me, what servers and the back of house do that give just that little extra TLC that make my dining experience extra pleasurable because eating out for me is a treat. It's 
it really is something special. It's not something I take lightly, you know, and therefore I don't often show up at kind of run-of-the-mill restaurants. I, last night I had dinner at Canteen um, right off the square. It was fabulous. The other night before <laughs> dinner was at an Indian restaurant out by East Town. I apologize for not remembering the name. You know, fish fry out on Lake Kaganza. Yeah, I'm probably my scale's not going to love it, but you know, it's been fabulous. And um, when a server catches on either explicitly because I've let them know or implicitly because they've observed that I might just need a little extra to have this experience be as meaningful for me as it is for my sighted dining companions, it sticks and it warms my heart I'll recommend that restaurant um, wholeheartedly to my friends and colleagues. So the word of mouth kind of marketing for the restaurant really benefits. When I've had a negative experience, that sticks as well. And uh, folks are probably going to hear about it. So, um, so today's opportunity is to kind of prepare in two ways. One for the dining in the dark experience that you'll be helping with, some of you'll be helping with tomorrow, so you feel ready and settled for that. And then overall to really support you as you launch into your um, career. So let's see if. Yay. Alrighty, turn the mouse around and everything works wonderfully. So this is an image from a dining in the dark experience that we um, have had um, in the past with Vignette Dining Club. And I don't know if you're familiar with Vignette, they're a pop-up dining club in the Madison area. So they have some of the events at their location, but a lot of times they do a pop-up um, experience, maybe in a museum, maybe in um, a park, maybe in a school cafeteria that somehow connects with the event. This one took place in their dining room in their old farmhouse in rural Fitchburg. So as you look at the image that's here, as you see it, what just say out a few things that you notice that might be similar or different from um, you know, a regular dining experience. And what I'll say is you don't need to raise your hand because as someone who's visually impaired, I'm not gonna see it. So um, I used to, I taught elementary age kids for about a dozen years before launching into other aspects of my career. And I used to tell my kids, this is not a lifelong skill anyway. You know, we're not walking around going, I'd like to say something. You know, we really find those places to say something in conversation. So just go ahead and say out what you're observing. So what do you notice in this picture that stands out for you? Name tags, yeah, exactly. Your diners usually don't show up wearing a name badge. You're the one wearing the name badge, but you know they're not showing up with name badges. In the dining in the dark experience, um, your diners tomorrow will have name badges. And we do that so that you, as those of you that will be serving, can identify that person by name. Because as you also probably noticed, these folks are wearing blindfolds, so they won't be seeing the food that comes in front of them, um, the actions of the servers. So, and because that will be a new experience for them to be under blindfold, we use the name tag so that the server can say that person's name to get their attention. So, great observation. What else do you observe that looks different here than when you might expect at a um, other dining experience or maybe looks similar? The placement of the water glass. Yeah, what are you noticing about that? The center of the Right, except for those renegades who've already moved their water glasses. Exactly. So it's placed at the at that tip of the placemat, and it's done universally for at least it was when the, before they sat down um, universally, so that the hand can follow the edge of the placemat and go right to where that water glass is at the tip. So it's an orientation technique. Um, to be able to have success with sliding the hand up, finding the water glass, picking it up, and taking a drink. Great observation. What else are you noticing? Well, flat was very simple. And there's just a fork and a knife. Right, exactly. And any spoon or anything special that is needed for that course um, came out with that course. So you might notice that. With the, in the ram, with the ramekins, the um, diners have a little spoon, and that one actually just came out with the, with the actual um, item. So yes, yeah, simple flatware, 
Um, and again, great universal design, so that the you know fork is on one side, the knife is on another, and it's not randomized. It's really um, set so that it's predictable. The diner can find the fork, the diner can find the knife. Last call, anything else that you see that stands out for you? I'm guessing that you're probably not used to seeing a triangular shaped placemat. So um, I brought one with me as well. So all this is is a napkin, and this one's a little small, but folded into a triangular shape. And so for the dining in the dark experience tomorrow, we'll ask for the dining room to be set up in this triangular shape. And when folks who are blind and visually impaired, especially if you've lost sight um, later in life, or even as a small child, this uh, triangle shape um, placemat is what's used in some of early instruction on how to navigate um, a table setting. And it's great because the plate can sit in the center, the knife and the fork can sit on the sides, and you can use then the shape of the placemat for orienting. So I often, when I, I move my water glass typically away from the tip, but I put it along the upper quadrant of the, um, the side of the triangle so that it's easy locating throughout um, the meal. And because your diners tomorrow, again, aren't used to being under blindfold, we help them um, with a little bit of orientation with a triangular shaped placemat. So tomorrow, if the dining room can be set with these, um, that would be wonderful in addition to the, um, to the regular napkin. Um, anything else that you notice? I just want to make sure that there's not something else that I've missed. There's not a lot going on on the table. There's just very simple center places. There's not a lot of um, extra stuff. Yes, there is, exactly. And, um, and that, um, you know, why do you think that might be? Why do you think there might be reduction of all the stuff that's on the table? <coughs> Less stuff to bump into. Bingo. Less stuff to bump into. And um, I know I've gone to some restaurants where it's like, whoa, you know, last night, even though the canteen was a lovely experience, there was a lot going on in the table. And it made it um, a little challenging for me to track where's the guacamole, which is very important to know, and where's the queso. And um, so I you know, needed, and there's big tall bottles um, with, filled with water to be able to refill water glasses. There's sauces, there's these little bags of really yummy chips and wagon wheels, they call them there. There's a lot going on. And so I needed to kind of clear that end of the table and we moved things to the other end that were not necessary for the dining experience so that it just created more ease for me to locate where the, chip, the chips, salsa, and queso, and guac were, and that it would reduce the risk of me knocking something over. So yeah, there's a lot less uh, busyness. I won't call it clutter, because one person's clutter is another person's beauty. Um, but there's a lot less busyness on the table to help reduce um, spillage and bumping into things and creating more ease for the diner so that they can relax in the dining experience. So where the heck did Dining in the Dark come from? And what is it really? So Dining in the Dark uh, started in Germany probably about 25 years ago um, as a way to do two things. One, create bridges of understanding between folks who are sighted and folks who are blind and visually impaired. And two, to really experience food in multi-sensory ways because removing sight really allows the diner to experience the taste, the texture, the temperature, um, even how food feels on the plate as you're navigating it with a fork, to really have a multi-sensory experience or even knowing how food sounds as you're filling, as you're eating from the plate, as the plate becomes empty, just to have a much more robust experience with food and to have a bridge to uh, the blind and visually impaired world. Dining in the dark is not a blindness sim simulation. So tomorrow, after having uh, lunch through Dining in the Dark, and there'll be faculty there, other students, staff, about 40 folks in all, those folks won't know what it's like to be blind. They can't walk out of there and go, I know, aha, I know, I know now. What they'll know is what it's like to eat lunch with a blindfold on. That's all, that's all they'll know. However, through the conversation at the tables, 
through the experience of being under blindfold, from the experience of having a multi-sensory um, um, opportunity with food, and through some of the discussion that we'll have um, during the meal and after the meal, they'll begin to or even go further in their understanding of creating inclusive environments. Because for the diner who is blind and visually impaired, we know our visual impaired experience, we've known it um, for many of us our whole lives, but we experience barriers all the time to being able to just move freely through the world. So they'll have some understanding of some of the barriers and understanding about their role in helping to remove the barriers. So Dining in the Dark started in Germany. It started in dark restaurants, so the lights were down or off completely. And the servers who served, some of them were uh, servers and, and food workers who were uh, blind and visually impaired themselves. And so the whole experience was in the dark. And there are a few uh, that have happened in New York that are similar. As we got to the Midwest um, and wanted to do these things here, we didn't know servers who were blind and visually impaired. And unfortunately, I'm not sure that there's a lot of folks in the food industry who are blind and visually impaired. And I'd love to see that switch up as well. But anyway, um, we modified by having the diners be under blindfold and the servers having the advantage of having lights on or natural light in the dining room so that they could be able to do their work. Um, so tomorrow everybody will have a blindfold on. They're welcome to keep it on throughout the meal, but at any point if they feel a little disoriented or a little claustrophobic, we always invite them to pull the blindfold up and then pull it back down again as they're ready. Of course, if they have to get up to go to the bathroom or something, we encourage them, <laughs> highly encourage them to take the blindfold off. So, um, dining in the dark. So I wanna touch base a little bit on who are the folks who are blind and visually impaired. So I wanna ask you the question of, if you know folks in your world, um, maybe in the past, maybe now, who are blind and visually impaired, and if you do, just go ahead and say out, you know, not that person's name necessarily, but who they are. Are they a relative? What age are they? You know, are they somebody you go to school with or went to school with when you were still back in uh, K-12? So anybody know somebody who's visually impaired? I have a friend that just had a baby that is blind. Okay, just had a baby and, and that um, friend is blind. Has she been blind her full life? No, the baby's blind. Oh, the baby's blind, gotcha. Okay, so we have a brand new little person who is visually impaired or blind. And, and uh, certainly we, we still see babies and young children who are either blind at birth or blind within the first short um, part of life. The exciting news is that's decreasing. So I'm in my mid to late 50s. There were, it was pretty not terribly uncommon to have a baby born either prematurely or um, small for gestational age and for us to have some sort of visual impairment, which is where mine comes from, mine's congenital. But the, and the exciting news is that over time, the number of babies born with visual impairment continues to decrease. So brand new baby and exciting for that and scary for that family. So you know, connecting to service right away, really important. Who else? Um, I heard another voice over here. Exactly, one of your colleagues. And uh, if it's the colleague I'm thinking of, yes. <laughs> um, works really to, as, um, to support students with disabilities in having access. So again, there's a, a great example of someone who is working age, um, who is um, employed by the college, who is helping to remove barriers and act, create more access for someone who's visually impaired, also happens to be a person of color. So um, blindness and visual impairment goes across all racial groups. We see certain things, um, certain diseases that might be more prone in one than another, but really it goes across all social, all social and racial groups. Um, it's exciting to know folks who are blind and visually impaired who are employed because about 70% of us are, un, under, are unemployed and about another 22% are underemployed. 
of all the disability groups, um, blindness and visual impairment causes the great, greatest level of unemployment. It's um, pretty powerful to think seven of 10 people who would love to be working are not working. Um, other folks that you might know. My cousin. Yeah, your cousin. What age group is your cousin? Okay, cool. And, and visually impaired since birth, or? No, he lost his sight <clears throat> after a car accident. Okay, thank you so much, and my heart to him. So we, have, we experience folks who lose their sight suddenly or traumatically. Okay, anybody else? We have a customer at work, and he's great. He's in his, um, I think he's about 48. He's actually the director um, of a plant that uh, produces um, Terra's Way, which is an organic. Yep. Um, way product, the, the way production plant, and it's cool because he's like the senior guy. Yep. Um, he had something going on, and so they did chemotherapy on him to prevent his eyesight from deteriorating more. Mm -hmm. I don't quite know the whole story about it. Um, and he has a great attitude about it. He refers to his wife as his seeing eye wife. <laughs> and, um, and I mean, if, if you make a joke like, like I one day I said, oh, it's good to see you, and he's like, yeah, back at you. Like he'll joke about it, <laughs> yeah. which I appreciate. Yes, exactly. We've learned at work to be really thoughtful. Hey, Randy, coming in hot with your plate, and we've just all sort of picked up on what to do to help yes. Randy. Yes. Or we catch Tara, his wife's eye, so that she kind of will say, hey, Randy, they're bringing our plates. You know, like I, I've noticed that she'll move his glass for yeah. him. Yeah. No matter where we put it, she may move it. Um, so she picks up a lot of the slack, but I think all of us, the more that we've served him, the more we've um, we've adapted. And he was really excited that we, we were doing this program at school. I gave him the handout about it, and awesome. that was really cool. So he can't drive. I think he used to be able to drive. Right. Um, and I, I think he sees less than 20%. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I, I know that he has like really big font on his phone. And, yes, exactly. But he's gainfully employed. He, he, you know, he's the guy in charge of a pretty big operation. So I love so much of what you said. So first of all, I love that he's a leader, as am I, and uh, and it's so exciting to see folks in leadership positions who have disabilities, um, because often we reach a glass ceiling. So very powerful to have him bust through that. And then the other things that I really loved about what you said is that it's been a learning process for you and your colleagues um, to, to figure out, you know, playful phrases coming in hot with the plate. You know, I love that. Um, or that his wife will make some minor modifications um, very subtly and clear, clearly to just create more ease for everybody. And, um, and, and that he, is a regular customer. So a regular customer is telling you that you've created a sense of welcome. And someone who has lost sight over time. And you're right, people with significant visual impairment, we don't drive. So transportation is often one of our greatest barriers. So there's great restaurants, like I love to go eat um, fish along Lake Kaganza, but I'm not going alone because there's no public transit there. So, you know, I'm always going with friends and dependent on talking them into why going there would be a good idea tonight. So, um, anybody else? Let's do one last call. I work with two clients that are visually impaired. So, one of them is a married couple, and the other one is single, and the couple one is always hilarious. So, I always <laughs> I'm not supposed to handle the medical stuff, but sometimes the nurses need to get them out. Right. So I have to pick them up and put them on the exact same spot they need to be on. Yes. And then with the single man, um, he usually complains about everything, and the nurses too. So. Yeah, so what I appreciate about, there's two things in your story that I really appreciate. One is that importance of putting things back exactly so that they are really locatable. So when you pick up the water glass and fill it, you know, putting it back um, in the you know similar place to where you picked it up from. Same thing with the wine glass, you know, is incredibly helpful and it reduces the risk of spillage and just creates more comfort. And then I really appreciated that the couple that you work with, hilarious, and then you've got you know a, a bit of a curmudgeon with your other client. So I think it really speaks to that 
uh, folks with disabilities and people who are blind and visually impaired are as diverse in our temperaments as anybody else. Some of us have just, you know, we've got enough gusto for life for about 10 people and other people, you know, um, you know, have just struggled to find more of that joy in life and whether or not they have a visual impairment. So in Wisconsin, there are about 100,000 folks that we, that we can identify who are blind and visually impaired. We would guess that there's more. And the only reason we would guess that there's more is that there, a lot of people don't want to identify because of so much societal um, uh, uh, bias. So, and the greatest population of folks who are blind and visually impaired that continues to grow exponentially are our elders. So our grandparents, potentially our parents, potentially ourselves someday when we're elders because we're living longer and because of eye-related um, disabilities. So by the time and diseases. So by the time that uh, we have another 10 to 15 years past, the number of folks who are blind and visually impaired throughout the United States and Wisconsin's no exception is expected to double. So the likelihood that folks with visual impairments will show up in your restaurant venues or at your events is pretty, is pretty significant. So let's get to the dining experience itself. So throughout the dining experience, if someone comes to the restaurant who is blind and visually impaired, and you know that pretty openly because they either have um, a white mobility cane like I do, um, or they are with um, a um, guide dog or a leader dog, or they have their seeing eye wife or husband or friend, um, and they might be um, lightly touching the elbow of that person or having that person walk just um, close to them. I often don't want to do the elbow thing because I have some functional vision, but when I'm going someplace new and I'm with someone, I usually have them to my right because I have more, more vision out of my right eye. I have no vision out of my left eye, but I keep them close. And so there's some, you know, some um, things that you might pick up in the relationship between the people if they don't have a cane or a dog with them that might cue you that the person has, somebody in the party has a visual impairment. So your best self is the person who gets to show up. So, you know, your kindness gets to come forward, your best professional self gets to come forward, and your ability to just relax and be present. And I love some of the stories that a couple of you have told this morning, that being able to joke, being able to be warm, being able to be friendly, finding your, your rhythm, because I'm guessing that each one of you likes to try to find your rhythm and your niche with each of your um, patrons. And that's really the same that is true when you're serving somebody who's blind and visually impaired. So as, the, as folks come to the table, I'm gonna ask you to take a look over at the other screen. So before we even get them seated, uh, let's take a look a second at the place setting that's over on the screen to, um, to the far, my far left, your far right. Um, what do you notice about that place setting? What kind of jumps out to you at, um, for that one? And just go ahead and call it out again. Yeah, no triangle, exactly. So, you know, we let go of the triangle because these people aren't dining in the dark. We're always dining in the dark when we're visually impaired. So um, we're just coming to a regular restaurant. So, yeah, exactly. So we've got the regular placemat kind of thing going on behind. What else do you notice? Simple setup again, exactly, exactly. Simple setup again. And um, in contrast, so uh, most restaurants that I've been to have either had white plates or black or dark blue plates. You know, sometimes they're a little bit more varied, especially some of the funky kind of coffee shop restaurants. I think at uh, the one downtown, Short Stack, it's like they went to St. Vinny's and bought the dishes there because they're all varied and that's, you know, kind of fun dining room experience. Um, you know, although I'm like, uh, I don't know, you know, sometimes the busy dishes are a little bit exhausting, but they're simple, um, simple dishes, and so high contrast. So you put the dark placemat behind a um, lighter plate, and then now it's really easy for those of us who have some functional vision to locate where things are at on the placemat. So Hannah, do you have a free hand to go change a couple things out? Or are you very busy? Yeah, I'm back there. Okay, you're back there, okay, great, thank you. 
So go ahead and just change out to the colored one. So a lot of restaurants that I've been in, especially when I've been traveling and I've gone to chains, you know, they have the placemat with the, you know, this is why our burger is awesome, and they have a picture of the burger or a picture of the salad um, on the placemat, other things going on. So we didn't have one of those, but we did have a placemat with a lot of pattern on it. And what do you observe, how is this place setting different now when Hannah changed out and went to the, um, the more busy place, um, placemat? The placemat itself is uh-huh, yes, exactly. Harder to see the plate. Harder to see the plate, yep. Anything else? Silverware too. Yep, everything gets a little bit lost. And, uh, and for those of us who don't have depth perception, sometimes we're like, oh, is that thing flat? Or is it rising up? And so we don't quite know if all those designs on the placemat are three-dimensional or they're flat. You know, logical deduction would lead us to know that they're flat, but it's still bit disorienting. So even for those of you, you who may likely have typical sight, you're like, hmm, a little distracting. So Hannah, go ahead and uh, change out to the last one. The white on white, and thank you so much. And what are you noticing about, what's the impact of white on white? It's no good. <laughs> Everything is lost, exactly. Everything is lost and it's very disorienting and, um, and just hard to keep track of. So, um, you know, as, you, um, as you're thinking about and talking, especially when you, you move to the place of managing front of house and a lot of those decisions are within your control, even just thinking about how are we setting the table um, so that we create inclusivity and welcome for all of our guests, because even some of you went, uh, too busy, I don't, I don't like it. Um, to have that much um, going on at the place setting. I'll run up a triangle so we can swap to the triangle. Oh, great, thank you. You have it swapped out? Yep. Okay, cool. Just any observations about when the triangle is there? One of the things I noted the first time I visited um, in the diner next door is the use of black and white. And I was like, oh, Paul, this is fabulous. Because it was that simple, it's kind of elegant, and it is so easy for orientation. So um, I, was, I was pretty impressed when I saw how the dining room was set up. So yeah, so for tomorrow, that uh, triangle, I think, will be really, really helpful. When you come back, Hannah, will you grab the plate for me? Because I'm gonna use the plate in a, in a couple minutes. I have a big question. Yeah. Uh, about the napkin, is, is um, recommended put it like a side of a, a, the plate, or we usually put it you know, over the plate? Uh, what is the best way that we can actually set up? That's a great, that's a great question. Thank you. If the napkin um, is over the plate, then having a nice contrast between the napkin color and the plate, especially if the salad plate is out or some other bread plate's out already, so that um, I can, we can see where the napkin begins and ends and where the, um, and where the plate is. That's really helpful. And putting the napkin actually on the plate um, is helpful for me because sometimes I won't even notice that there's a bread plate off to the side, you know, if it's if it's placed away. So, you know, I kind of I kind of personally like that. Other folks may not as much, but I really like the contrast napkin with the um, with the with the plate um, underneath it. Um, the napkin, all beautiful, fanned out in the cup. Um, while I know it's really pretty, ooh, confusing. Um, and um, because the first thing I'll need to do is figure out where the napkin is because it's not in the usual place and I'll be like oh is that a flower is that a napkin I don't know and so now I'm a little more apprehensive about just reaching out and grabbing it and so I'm watching you know I'm trying to pay attention to the other diners at my table what are they doing where are they getting their napkins from so it's a little anxiety producing um, even though it's it's quite pretty, and I can see why folks like to do it. So, great question. Anything else about setting the table before we get our diner seated? I noticed that on your first picture you had uh, flowers on the table. Uh, not really necessary, though, because it's just added to the busyness. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thanks. And you know, I think that there's still this like wonderful dynamic tension, and I love that it exists, between wanting to set a really beautiful table and keeping the table simple. And, um, and I think that that's a really important dynamic tension to have because as someone who has some functional site, and many of your diners will, um, the number of folks who are truly uh, fully blind, no light perception, no color perceptions, only about 5%. So the majority of your diners will have some functional vision. And so, you know, I, while I love simplicity at the table, there's still something about beauty as well and the combination of simple and beautiful. So those little tiny bouquets, I liked them because the likelihood of them obstructing what was happening at the table or getting in my way, um, you know, pretty reduced, but yet they have that little simple elegance. So I think, you know, as restaurant um, folks, it's always managing that dynamic tension of simplicity and elegance or a beauty. So I really appreciate you naming it. What about Ufta. Right. Let me know they're there. You know, because um, there's times that I'm like, oh, we're getting hot. Oh, it must be a candle. You know, um, and sometimes if it's a really dark restaurant, a candle will cast sometimes a helpful bit of light for navigating the menu and stuff. Sometimes it actually creates kind of this glare spot and then everything else is dark. So um, just, you know, let me know that it's there or if lighting the candle when the diner sits down is part of the tradition. Um, at your restaurant, then you could just even ask, would you like your candle lit? And then I'm in control of what is going to work well for me. Because sometimes they're really beautiful and other times, oof, yeah. And, or if I don't know how close I am to it and I'm handing something to someone and uh, yeah, I'm feeling that heat and it's a little scary. And if someone's lost their sight with traumatic brain injury or migraine issues, yeah. then the candle is problematic. Right, it creates that aura and it can trigger seizure activity or migraine. How about a tablecloth? Uh, again, if there's contrast. So um, contrast is really a big deal So um, because it just helps with orientation of where things are at. So when there's no contrast, white plate, white tablecloth, oofta. You know, again, really hard. And one of the things that I'll do as a diner with a visual impairment is I'll often place my hand, where's that plate? Right, the right along the edge of the plate um, when I'm eating because that's helping me to have orientation about where the plate is. And so if there's white plate, white tablecloth, uh, white napkins, everything gets um, pretty lost. So tablecloths are awesome if we've created contrast. Um, and sometimes I've even seen folks have the white tablecloth, but then have um, a placemat over it just to, um, to create again that contrast and, and sometimes create even that look of a little bit more elegance. Great questions. What about, anything else? What about printing of the food and solids? Cool. Let's get there in just a second because I, I definitely want to go there. So let's get our, let's get our diner seated. So um, just a couple of things. When you, when you notice that somebody is visually impaired and you actually are gonna be seating them, what couple of things do you think would be great to keep in mind as you're seating someone? <coughs> Gotta slow your roll, getting them to the table. There have been times that the, um, that the person who's seating me is taken off and I'm like, where did they go? <laughs> They're not here anymore. <laughs> And I know you're busy and I know you're trying to be efficient. Uh, it's really about checking in to see if your potential diner is with you or not. Um, and, um, and, and even if I'm with a sighted companion, my wife or my friends or whatever, they often go first and I follow, but then now they're in this predicament of the host or hostess is marching fast. They're trying to make sure I'm okay. So they're doing this thing. She's over there, got her. Oh, she's over there, got her. You know, and they're trying to, to juggle the moving fast, keeping pace with making sure that I'm actually following and navigating the space. So slow the roll. What else might you want to keep in mind as you're getting somebody seated? Um, clear passage. Clear passage, yep, clear passage. They'd be quicker for you to go from point A to point B, um, but there's a lot of pushed out chairs, purses hanging off of chairs. 
um, or maybe having to navigate around a table, or you've got this lovely tree in your dining room that everybody wants to be seated next to, or whatever, the fireplace. You know, it might not be as efficient, but the clearest path um, is really most helpful, especially if we're using a cane and or a dog, because those are tools that are helping us navigate um, but it's fascinating walking through a restaurant, an airport, anything else, as soon as people see my cane, they're doing this fascinating thing of trying to get away from it. So they're pulling in their chairs and they're grabbing their purses. And so if you're taking um, me through a tight passageway, it's also creating some anxiety for the, um, for the other patrons as well. Anything else? Um, for the sake of tomorrow, yeah. are they walking in with one foot on or are they sitting they're going to sit tomorrow, and um, and then when, and we'll do some um, welcoming things, and then they'll go ahead and um, and put their blindfolds on. So you won't have to worry about seating for tomorrow. Okay, I'm noticing time, so I want to keep um, keep us rolling. As you give them the menu as well, you can check to see if um, you know they would like a braille menu if your restaurant provides those. Um, and many restaurants do not. And while it's nice to have access to a Braille menu, again, only about five to 10% of folks who are visually impaired read Braille. So, um, you know, so often folks will offer a Braille menu to me and I'm not a Braille reader and they'll be like, really, you sure you don't want the Braille menu? I'm like, yeah, I'm quite sure because I really won't know what I want to eat after I look at the Braille menu. Um, having menus go online, oh my gosh, what a liberating thing. It has been so amazing because I can look at the menu either ahead of time or even when I get to the table and I can make my own choices because some of the um, things that people who are blind and visually impaired do as coping mechanisms is we ask about the specials because we want to hear them anyway, but sometimes it'll be like, okay, good, I don't have to have somebody highlight the menu for me. Or we'll order what other people at the table are ordering, even if we didn't quite want that, but we don't have to try to navigate the menu. So um, menus online, really, really awesome. So let's go to the, and, and talking directly to the person. I think, you know, just to me, you guys feel like you, you got that one, but I can tell you, even yesterday when I was out shopping for clothes, the gal who was bringing me to the, um, tr the fitting room, talked to my, um, my partner that was with me and said, her fitting room is right here. Well, hers right here. All you have to do is tell me your fitting room is right here. And so that is still a very common experience that those of us with visual impairment face is someone talking to our sighted um, companions as if we're not even there. So what would she like? Well, I would like a brandy old fashioned and fish. Thank you very much. So, um, so that I think is just, just to know, please just address us directly. So let's go to play dance. So what kind of things do you do now for plating and what impact do you think that might have on the visually impaired diner? So what are some of your good kind of protocols for plating? <laughs> Paul's like dying right now. <laughs> well, it's nicer when things on the plate are already close to bite size, so that yeah. people don't have to work so hard. And that's for any diner. Exactly. Yeah, I you know I love salad and um, and I love you know fun fun funky salads. But if the lettuce doesn't have or the spinach or whatever greens don't have kind of a nice chop on them, and I go in and I you know try to cut them, and then I pick up the fork and I've got a piece of green that's as big as my face. You know, it's like mm, this is not the best um, dining experience that I've ever had because then I'm worried about the dressing and the fake, you know, just all of it. And um, so I'll, as a diner who's visually impaired, I'll often ask for an extra chop on the greens. You know, I had a beautiful meal breakfast one morning um, at a restaurant downtown with an arugula salad. It was lovely, but the, the leaf and the stem were all still whole on the arugula, and it did make eating it challenging. So bite-sized pieces on the plate. You may get a diner who, um, if they order a steak, I'm not a beef eater, so this wouldn't be true for me, but if they might ask you to even cut that steak um, into bite-sized pieces before it leaves the kitchen. 
so that when it comes to them, they've got easy access to it. When I'm ordering, for example, um, I love chicken, um, tandoori chicken, it's one of my favorites, but I know that that's often cooked on the bone because it helps with keeping the meat moist and uh, flavor, but I won't order that in a restaurant. I'll uh, order it to go, for example. Any other plating things that feel really important? Put it in the center of the plate. Yeah, put it in the center of the plate. Exactly, leave some nice edges because again, I might be putting my hand along that edge of that plate to help with guidance. Anything else that you want to keep in mind or think, thinking about with good plating technique? Don't spread things out. Don't what? Don't spread things out? Yeah, this whole kind of deconstructed movement thing is, is really cool. I mean, I can see that we had a Dining in the Dark at Charlie's on Main the other um, last week, and he did a deconstructed dessert with two strawberry cheesecake. So he had two chocolate dipped strawberries on the plate, a chunk of cheesecake with like a fig um, compote at the top, and then a dollop of his special um, caramel sauce somewhere on the plate. And deconstructed dishes, it's like, you know, seek and find. And um, so I was really grateful as he put down the plates to say the strawberries are located at about 11 and 1 o'clock on your plate, the cheesecake is located right in the center of the plate, and the dollop of caramel sauce is at 8. So it doesn't mean that we can't deconstruct uh, a dish, because that is a cool thing, but really be mindful of when it's being served of uh, how you're describing it to the visually impaired diner. Anything else about plating? Everything should be edible. <laughs> Please, everything edible. Yes, I can, <laughs> seriously, I can tell you how many toothpicks I've bit into. Yeah, so when we kind of a sandwich together um, with, a, with a toothpick or, you know, something like that, um, you know, sometimes we need that toothpick in it to make it successfully from the kitchen to the dining room without slide off. Um, let your diner know there's a toothpick in it, offer to remove it if they'd like you to do that. But yeah, I, I you know, I, I'm kind of like, oh, I'm not a woodchuck, I don't really want to chuck this wood. But um, I have eaten a toothpick or partially bitten into a toothpick or two. Anything else? I think the same rules apply for plating uh, for our guests at this level because uh, everything that we put on the plate is supposed to be edible. Um, it should be pork ready. Right. Um, and then in that particular case, we can uh, change that a little bit too. Um, but exactly. I think I've always said that your diners, when they come to a, at this level, the ease of eating the food is what's significant here. They shouldn't have to struggle to eat what's on the plate. Exactly. They're usually impaired or not. I think that's super important. I think that is super important. And what I love about how you framed that, Paul, and how you've been framing it with with everybody is that it's just part of good universal design. And when we're doing good universal design, so many people benefit. So let me check my time, because you guys are done at 20 after, right? right. Okay, we are at 20 after. So um, uh, just a couple other quickies, because I want to make sure you get to your next class on time if you need to. Um, so when you're serving, um, you know, just let it, you know, serving from always the same direction. I don't personally care if it's left or right. I kind of failed Emily Post, but um, just be consistent. So if you're serving and you start serving and clearing from the right, then just stay consistent throughout the meal. That'll be true for tomorrow as well, um, so that I know to expect you. Um, my invitation is to not touch the diner, um, even as though I'm super huggy. Um, often what happens for people with disabilities is we get overtouched. You know, people feel like they can touch us to get our attention, touch us to have, you know, take our arm and lead us someplace. Always ask permission if it's okay to touch and, you know, and saying the person's name or even just saying ma'am um, is really is very helpful for getting my attention. Um, so frequently I've had the experience where a server is handing me something, like a plate, I'm like, oh God, please don't do that. Um, uh, because this, this has disaster written all over it. So even if it's difficult to get to that diner because of how things are configured, either ask to have the plate passed or get your body in there to serve. Last couple things, when you are doing the check, 
um, and uh, checks often are a challenge, so I brought a couple of, um, these are called signature guides, and you know what I'd love is for everybody to just have one. You've got pens in your pockets. As servers, keep a, pen, uh, keep a signature guide in your pocket as well uh, when you're out in the industry working because you can place this on the bill in the place where they need to sign. It can be slid up to where the tip goes because we definitely want to make sure you're tipped and then slid down to where the signature is. And if you've got a little light or a flashlight available, that can also be really helpful. I often use the flashlight on my phone so that I can see um, the check, I don't always want to just turn it over to my spouse to do. I'm perfect and I'm a better tip calculator than she is and the server benefits when I calculate the tip. So I want to be able to um, be able to, to do that as well. Last couple things that if you've got time to take a look, I want to invite you up to look at some of the things for back of house that create greater inclusivity. Nice long oven mitt reducing the ability to you know, burns that we have restaurant owners and bakers who come into our store at the Wisconsin Council of the Blind to buy these because they love them. So great tool again for sighted folks, not sighted folks. Um, contrast cutting boards, onions on this side or garlic, and then other things on this side like potentially green peppers, tomatoes. And uh, that contrast again reduces injuries um, and being able to really participate as a, as a worker, as, as a home cook. Um, and then keeping one of these in your pocket if you're a server, it's a, called a 2020 pen or a bold writer pen. And it just writes darker so that um, the, the restaurant patron can do the check more independently, but it doesn't have the uh, brain killing chemicals that, um, that a Sharpie has. It's a non-stinky. Non and then a cutting guard. So um, I heard a couple of you got, somebody got cut. I'm, I'm so sorry, but chopping is accident. Here we go, chop, 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 chop. And uh, reduces the likelihood of um, getting cut. And back to our plate. Noticing that this has edges to it and a little bit of a bowl shape. I love restaurants that don't have just flat plates because things can skittle off of them with um, the greatest of ease. So a little bit of edging on you, what you use for serving is going to be particularly important tomorrow um, with folks who are not experienced with eating in the dark. Um, to give them some edges to work off of. And if you do a soup course, put the soup. Um, in a bowl on a plate so that again we reduce some of the mess and reduce some of and give some edges So I'm going to stop there because you need probably to skittle on um, Here's ways to connect with us. We also just added Instagram so you can find us under WC blind there as well um, We'll stay for a few minutes. So if you want to talk more ask questions welcome to do that Paul Is there anything for tomorrow? that you'd like to touch base on so that folks feel really ready that I might have missed. Um, well, so we don't have quite the, the plate where you have, but we have them. They're, they're all bowl like so that they have Perfect. Um, glassware too, we have stem glassware. Perfect. We touch that so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed that in the pictures they weren't using stemware, so I'm a little concerned about that. You can use stemware tomorrow, and one of the hints I'll give to the diners is to slide their hand along the table, find the base of the stemware, slide the hand up the stemware to the bowl of the stemware. So um, we'll, we'll give that tip tomorrow. So um, I would like to uh, thank Denise and Hannah here for coming in today.
by your establishment to come out with is pretty good. Yeah. And I think that's super important. And I think that uh, the other things that Denise talked about was what it was like to die down now, um, going into operations that are not prepared for that. And then to, to the one that really caught my attention the most, though, was that um, the person that is dining with them that is visually impaired um, deserves the same respect as the person that's dining with them. And so communicating directly to them, I think, is super important. Um, I think that, you know, I also noticed that you said her bathroom. Um, I'm a directional person. I yes. would say, Denise, it's on the right. Mm -hmm. Denise, it's on the left. Exactly. Um, I find I can't stand when you turn there. Where? Um, that doesn't mean anything. And so tomorrow, when you are bringing food to the table, you want to say it. On your right is the rabbit, on your left is your vegetables, and on your wherever is the sauce, whatever, just so they know where, where things are. It should be a guessing game for them. And so part of what we're doing tomorrow is that the course will be announced. Um, and, and once it's uh, set down, people will know what's in front of them. Uh, and I think that's super important too. And then also if there are any questions too um, that might be imperative for them to have good yeah, thank you, everybody. Have a great at rest of the day. Oh, one other thing, you can use the plate too as a clock face. So some of, um, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is getting more and more dated because we have so many digital clocks. But it, if you still remember the 12, the three, the six, and the nine, um, you can use that as an orientation tool too. And just tomorrow when you're serving, you know, just kind of pick an orientation tool and stick with it. If you go, jump back and forth between clock face and right, left, You'll confuse your diner a little bit, but you know, just just relax, have fun tomorrow. There is, there are no fails tomorrow. Everything will work out as a great learning opportunity. Your diners will be curious. You'll be curious. Just have fun with the experience. So thanks so much, everybody. It's been really fun to hang out with you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.